Okay, Mark Kimberling. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, we had a. Uh, yes. Okay. Just right and left, and there's your timer. It'll go up to 20 minutes. Great. All right. I noticed that we're already uh, a little bit behind our time. And so uh, I, I'm actually broken up into two sections. And one is the uh, volume of uh, criminal prosecutions, how often does it happen in healthcare fraud. And the other one in the second session is going to be in the area of intent, uh, things that will get you on a radar or maybe help keep you off the radar. But um, as, as you heard originally, or as soon as he started out, he talked a little bit about me and the fact that I've been in this town for a while. Um, I came out here as an FBI agent back in the early 80s. And I think you all had your lunch speaker, Frank Collada. And did you tell this, uh, no, no stories? Uh, my wife used to work with the Organized Crime Strike Force, a branch of the federal government when I was with the FBI. Frank was uh, kept in the basement of the federal building for a long time while he was waiting to be pulled up to testify. They built a little apartment down there for him. Other times he was up at certain houses in certain areas and I was out in, a, in an advanced role making sure things were clear and then they'd load him up in those places. Um, my wife, we weren't married at the time, and uh, Frank, uh, you need a lot of stuff uh, notarized and signed and taken care of, and so my wife was always doing this notarization, and she was well known around the federal courthouse, and somehow probably some of the uh, courthouse uh, security mentioned the fact that, oh, are you going up for Judy, Kem you know, Judy Neeling's uh, birthday cake? And uh, Frank goes, what? what? What's going on? What's with Judy? He goes, it's her birthday. Frank got her a birthday card. All right. Um, I started dating my wife uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and uh, I heard about that, and so I got message down to Frank, and uh, that was about the closest of a one-on-one -on -one conversation he had with me. Um, there were no more cards sent to my wife, and uh, Frank and I have. Uh, uh, I know his uh, his handler, his keeper. I know who brought him in. I know some other things. I, I believe some of you went on a tour, uh, and I don't know if Frank brought it out during lunch on how he feels the uh, skim of the Stardust Casino was discovered. Um, I don't know if they told you that when Lefty Rosenthal was blown up in his car, it was in between a Marie Callender's and a Tony Roma's restaurant in a shared parking lot in a residential neighborhood. It was not a good thing to happen in that neighborhood. Um, I used to be around the Spalachos houses for ages. Um, uh, but as far as other things that he would talk about, uh, how the skim actually happened, the crew I worked with, were, we were reviewing some paperwork and uh, we noticed two cars in a grocery store parking lot early one morning uh, off of Tropicana and they pulled up from opposite directions. They stopped. There was a large lunch bag, paper bag that went between the cars, and that was the start of the exchange of the cash on the skim. And from there, we were able to get some license plates and some other actions and some other things took off. So that was, uh, I know that other people feel, the, uh, nobody really will tell how the skim really uh, was found out or originated, uh, the original sources of it. Uh, some people believe it was Lefty um, uh, or De Niro, whatever. Uh, they did bring me out because in that movie Casino, when that airplane landed in, uh, on a golf course and actually, actually went to the water hole, um, I'm a pilot. Some of those people had to move on, and uh, shortly after, I was probably, uh, actually, actually, I was one of the first single men to be brought back out to Nevada after what was called a Mother's Day massacre. They had a bunch of uh, agents in Las Vegas who evidently just became a, um, a little comfortable with the lifestyle here and the FBI would always do these major inspections every few years and so a series of people got transferred out and they said well, we can never send uh, single, single people to Las Vegas again. And so several years went by and I was uh, probably one of the first new, first re-wave of uh, single men to come back out here. And that didn't last too long, you know, I met my wife and been happily married ever since. All right. 
And there's a lot of stories we can, we can skip uh, Colada in that era. There, there are a lot of better uh, old, old war stories, but uh, that took up a, too much time as is. Um, the, first, the first topic is criminal prosecutions and just um, you know, how popular they are, they are or how many are there. Um, I came with the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit in 1996. That's when I showed up in, uh, I think, Nevada's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit was started in 92. Um, a little bit of history on this, because then only to get to these stats. And it, it'll come up in some later, well, maybe I can get to these. Okay, okay. Um, it started in, uh, as you can tell on that one, there was no criminal fraud oversight in 1975, New York State, who's always kind of progressive. Um, they noticed that they had problems in their nursing homes. Uh, Actually, what happened? There were bills for new roofs, new new whirlpools, things like that, and inspectors went out and they said, "Hey, there's not a new roof on this, and there's no whirlpool or spa in here." And they went to uh, the owner's house to question them about it. We had a brand new built-in swimming pool with a, a sunroom solarium with a nice slate roof. So we know where the roof and the and the spa went. It went into that into the owner's backyards. Um, that happened more than on one occasion. So through, through uh, cost report fraud on nursing homes, which resulted in a lower level of care to the long-term care patients, they started a pilot program. New York created it on a, as a, their New York Attorney General's office created it. It got picked up and during the uh, Carter administration was sent out to about 10 states as a pilot program. From there, um, it just grew, and every state that accepts federal funds as part of their state Medicaid dollars must have a Medicaid fraud control unit. And uh, um, Nevada's has 19 people. I operate out of two cities. Uh, uh, and I think now we'll get into some of the other stats. Um, we'll pick up on the, on the rest of this later. So how popular is it? Well, recently, as in last fiscal year, 1,564 convictions of medical professionals. And we've been fluctuating. This is on the state side, the state Medicaid fraud control units. We've been fluctuating from about 1,600 to 1,300 for about the last five, six years. Prior to that, there was a dip. Um, now, you'll see that you'll see some changes because, and also depending on where you're at, I have, I have a staff of 19, California has a staff of 185. So, uh, um, but here's a common statistic. So we're looking at 1,500, 1,600 a year on the state side. Most of our budgets are less than 1% of Medicaid expenditures in that state. So I run maybe uh, just under 2 million a year in my budget. And uh, so you know that Medicaid, the state of Medicaid is pumping out about 2 billion a year. In, uh, in provider fees and uh, services. Uh, so, and there's some, a lot, some administrative costs in that also. Um, oops, I hit, okay, yours went blank. Okay, okay, great. Um, so uh, another stat uh, that we'll just throw out is this is starting to become popular. It's so popular that once you get some federal money in it, somebody has to justify why are we putting federal money in this area of fraud. And then the next thing you know, the federal, the federal government will come up with certain acronyms. They do have one called HEAT. And HEAT is Healthcare Fraud Prevention Enforcement Action Team. That's the HEAT team. There's about 12 HEAT teams in this country and they focus on uh, healthcare fraud. And um, um, they, they have these big get-togethers and they group up certain time periods in which they'll try and get a lot of arrests or a lot of action going and they try to they gin up a lot of public awareness um, so it's it comes and goes on a popularity radar I know I'm talking to the choir and hopefully many of you haven't even heard of heat and uh, that's a good thing um, but I, I just referenced how many criminal convictions on the state side. Another really exciting statistic is there's about 765 criminal actions on the federal side, 
but uh, right around 600 convictions a year on the federal side. So nationwide on the federal side, there's only about 600 to 650 convictions. That may go up, and we know it's going to be under more scrutiny as the uh, health care changes are going through. Um, one of the things that is climbing off, off the charts are the civil frauds and the civil enforcements. Uh, it, the False Claims Act, which we'll get in in the second section, is very popular. If you haven't heard about the False Claims Act, I'll give you a quick run through when we get to the second section. Right now, I carry uh, personally about 340 some civil False Claims Act cases on health care fraud. I join up with many of the other states on these. They're filed on regional or national level, and sometimes the federal government uh, steps in and assists. Um, one, of, one of the important things about the False Claims Act and also about the criminal convictions are the exclusion results. Uh, all of the criminal cases uh, generally result in mandatory exclusions from being a provider in any type of health care facility or program that associates with uh, federal payors. And it usually starts about five years, a uh, five-year mandatory exclusion. Um, I personally have convicted uh, a few hundred medical professionals. Um, I even have an involuntary manslaughter conviction in, 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 on the resume. Um, I have seen people that have been convicted selling cars. So they've gone from being a physician to a car salesman. Next, I'm, hey, you're going to have to come back for the second session because uh, how to avoid that and, and some of my personal feelings on that will come out there. Um, what is a trend now? I'll be quite candid with you. People of your caliber aren't, aren't coming up very often, thank God. You know, very few uh, uh, surgeons are coming up and, on, uh, in the area of criminal convictions. Right now, there's a big push on long-term care, and um, not a push, but it seems to be trending convictions in the area of long-term care and home health care, and home health behavioral care. Not quite uh, psychiatry or psychology, but, uh, but it, is, uh, it is very popular. And I call those lost leader cases. You can get a lot of statistics, you can get a lot of big numbers, but you're not going to get a lot of recoupment out of it. It appears that the, uh, um, the home health care, the employees and that whole era is a lower claims or lower reimbursement rate. And by the time that money comes in, let's say it's $30 an hour. Well, they work for a company. The company is going to keep 10. The employee gets 20. Everybody has to eat. By the time we come along and we get a criminal conviction, we can't go to the grocery store and get the money that's already been spent. And a lot of it's been purloined on other, other habits. So to me, those are lost leader cases, and they should be dealt with more in a regulatory um, fashion than instead of using the criminal courts as that type of a tool. Um, but that's what's trending now, home health care. Um, okay, I think I basically killed the stats. I know that there's usually uh, what I just saw from Dr. Blitz, and a lot of things that Dr. Blitz said will come back. Uh, you'll hear some of the same phrases, uh, materiality, uh, consent, intent, knowledge. Um, th those will come up in the, in the next section. Uh, before we get there, I, Anybody, it, I know that you waited for the end because you wanted to make sure they were heard. If someone just wants to raise a hand and ask a question, I'll repeat it. It's on, and I'll give a quick answer. Any questions to this point? Statistics, types of crimes, uh, felonies, gross misdemeanors, okay. Mi misdemeanors. Okay, yeah. Could, could anybody else hear that? Could anybody I hear could. that question? We I can't, could. I, no, no, that's okay. I'll repeat it. It's a long question. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's uh, billing, a, billing an acceptable, submitting claims for an acceptable procedure. If you're in a certain practice group, 
are, you have certain types of procedures or payors. Certain procedures are accepted uh, commonly or readily available. Other procedures you may need prior authorization or they just will not, uh, they just will not authorize uh, the other procedure. Let's say the, so the issue is in order to assist or truly help or truly help the, the patient or the recipient, would you ever utilize the readily or easily acceptable claim code and really give the other service? Um, not so much, um, and he, he referenced a robbing Peter to pay Paul. Would that result in a crime? Well, think about it. Um, th that's kind of interesting. I'll give you the extreme. Um, government health care normally does not uh, pay for uh, breast enhancements, okay? Uh, cosmetic breast enhancements just aren't paid for. There are physicians who will bill something else, an acceptable code, and uh, for their cosmetic breast enhancements. Now that doesn't, unless you can really get uh, uh, psychiatrists or other people in there to show the benefit to the patient, um, you're really not helping that, that patient that much. Those have been convicted. Those have also been subject to civil fraud enforcement. Um, if we're talking about an area, maybe it's just more simple, if you have to go through a certain part of the lower abdomen to repair a hernia, um, there's a couple of codes that, uh, there are a couple of codes in, uh, for those procedures one of, uh, one of which is readily acceptable, one of them which is not. Um, if you're, and one of them's very expensive, uh, much more expensive than the other one. Um, we'll stand back, we'll see if it's a one-off pattern, if it is a, uh, and I'm speaking for myself, but when we get to the end of these slideshows, and you all can download that, keep it, and if anybody wants it, they can either contact Joe or contact, my contact information's at the end. But on a one-off scenario, um, there are educational issues that we'd go out, uh, I may even just have one of my investigators go out and talk. Very rarely do I have an investigator talk one-to-one -one with a physician, and usually their physician will have a lawyer in the room, so it'll either be me or one of my lawyers in the room also. But it'll be an educational issue, um, um, and it, it may just be a one-on-one -on -one dollar refund if, it's, if, it, if we really didn't see the benefit of it. Um, and the next slide you're going to see what's called overpayments versus fraudulent payments. Not on next slide, in the next session. Um, let's see, what's another real common thing besides the uh, cosmetics that are, is often billed for? There's about six or seven things that have trended. Standing out here looking at the physicians that probably think I'm a jerk for talking about taking their practices and their liberty away is a bit, uh, is a bit daunting to me. It's not like looking at 12 people in a jury box. So uh, bear with me for a little bit if I lose an example here or there, okay? Does that kind of answer it? If you had a habit of doing that, then that's something different. Now, if you started to get off the charts on that area and started to become an outlier type of that particular code, that's something different. Get into all the little factors that is gonna make that one off into truly something different. And we'll, we'll point out some other, other little areas to China uh, protect your practice and protect uh, protect you and protect your practice. Okay. I, I, I think I think I think oh. breast enhancements should have any reason to never be investigated. But okay. go, go on. <laughs> okay. That's not my opinion. That was that was okay. That was Magic's opinion. You've that was okay. Here's question two. I'm down to minute thirty-eight on this first section. Do you see how quick this goes? Uh, what percentage of, of my cases or in here in Nevada are related to opioid? Very little, very few. And uh, I did have a conversation with federal OIG just Thursday, Thursday, and they go, Mark, we're coming back out. I'm going to talk to you a little bit. It's that time. Me? This. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it looks like he wants you to drink up. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, very, very few right now. We've had and those cases are usually not government-related fraud in Nevada because in order to have a government-related fraud, Nevada, we work with Nevada Medicaid itself, and they have some safety, safety procedures. 
If you're a physician or anybody who's able to prescribe opio opioids, you have a second application process to go through, and, and there's some additional rules that are put upon you. And this, that you, might have all, you all may have already done this in your states. And then we have lockbox uh, pharmacies, restricting the recipient to only one or two places that they can go to under more scrutiny, uh, the recipient of the op opioids. Found out also is recipients and Medicare recipients are not the best illicit customers. Oh, I got to all messed up. Okay. Are they're not the best illicit drug customers? And so they talk a lot, and they, they don't they don't really do business and keep their mouth shut like Colada or somebody. So they're not to be trusted. So when you get the opioid cases coming in, it's usually all on the private practice side. Okay. Not too much uh, real government involvement. I will tell you one thing. West Virginia took on, um, gosh darn, I just forgot the name of the opioid. Uh, maybe it was Purdue. Years ago, Virginia took on Purdue because of how they believed these opioids were non-habit forming and non-problematic. -prob we'll get into one quick, I'm out. Okay. Virginia, Virginia made so much off of, off of Purdue, see I just left you hanging, that they permanently fund their Medicaid fraud control unit with the results of that case. They had so much that came to them from that case. It was over it was, uh, 60 some million in cost and fees to the Virginia MFCU. And that's only a fraction of what the case was. They can now draw down on that or the interest it earns and help self-fund their unit. My, bu my budget's a little bit more than two million and I spend a little bit less than, a, than, than two million. And what we do is in all these cases, and it's similar all over the country, but Nevada is one of the remaining totally self-funding cases, so uh, self-funding units. So if we get involved in these cases and there's money at the end, we give the feds their share right off the top. If there's a secret witness, they get paid. Uh, so the feds take their share because they put that money in to help fund the program. Right now in Nevada, it's 65-35. So that means that the 35, is part of that has to go to reimburse the state side of Medicaid and anything left over of that is mine. All right, so I self-fund uh, my share of my obligation of a $2 million budget on less than 35 cents on every dollar I collect. So is it out there? Yes. Okay. The state of Nevada has so much confidence in this program that they back me with $100 a year. So when I go to work and I got 19 people in two cities and they're carrying guns and driving cars, we got to get the job done for more than one reason. All right, I'm out now. <laughs> to return, I'll be back. We are very much looking forward to part two.